The best way to learn how to program a computer is by actually getting your hands on and typing and running the program that you've typed. We can do that. We'll do that right now. One of the tricks is when you're learning a programming language, you'll want to go through a tutorial. It's actually better if you also modify and play with the examples. What's great about Rust by Example is that if you Google this, Google for Rust by Example, you will also be able to uh, edit and play with the uh, editor directly in the tutorial. This is really beneficial because I, I know from uh, firsthand experience that this is a really great way to learn how to program by actually getting your hands on. Let's try it. We're going to learn how to build uh, a Rust application that uh, is written uh, and Rust is a really powerful modern language. It has the performance of a C compiled language and it's, it's, it's as fast as we possibly can get, which is fantastic. And so it's a language that is uh, very well loved and it's great to learn it because it also has all these guardrails. It, they make it easy to sort of uh, write a lot of code, make a lot of changes, and the compiler will take care of checking the most common problems that you'd run into when you write code. The downside is, of course, the compiler is going to uh, complain a lot because you'll, in myself, I write code and it will not be good code. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be pretty... Uh, um, problematic in several ways. The compiler will help you along though. Let's give it a check out here. Let's uh, let's try it really quick. So what we're going to do here is we're going to walk through a couple of the examples uh, and you'll want to click on these examples directly like hello world and it's going to give you uh, a code editor directly here on the page and you can press this play button and it will run the program immediately. You can also modify the program and then run the code again like that and then it will run it and then it uh, executes the code in your changes. So we'll walk through this a little bit more here in a bit. Let's learn how to write a Rust program and actually run it and compile it within a browser directly in the tutorial. What's great about learning Rust is they do offer a Rust by example, which allows you to edit the code on the page in the tutorial and modify it and play with it. I think this is a huge step towards getting to know a language better by uh, modifying and seeing how things work when you make those changes. Now, what we're going to do here is we're going to walk through the Hello World. Make sure to check out a Rust by Example. Just uh, Google for Rust by Example and then click on the Hello World. This is going to take you to the first uh, tutorial, which is, you know, of course, the, the best tutorial. I'm going to get rid of some of these uh, uh, code comments so you can see what the program is just as, as it is right here. So we've got a simple hello world, which is just going to print the word hello world and then it's going to exit. So we've got our our, uh, our main function here, which when a program starts, when you run a program, it will start from this point. It'll execute this statement, which says print, print ln with an explanation point indicates that it's a macro, which means it's just a function that has it's got the same it's the same as regular functions with this uh with this macro the the bonuses and the benefit is that they uh, provide extra functionality that are front loaded through the build process and the compile time making the program more efficient this is one of the reasons why rest is really powerful and fast is the compiler is really powerful and allows you to write efficient code in a safe manner so we'll run this program here and it will print hello world and then I'm gonna say something else. Let's say something. Hello. What happens if I put in a? We'll put a heart icon in there. And see what happens. All right. We'll we'll try that. See if it's a print. And it worked. So it printed. So I just uh, wrote my own Rust program. I ru I ran it, and it's doing a little bit more. This is great because now you're. You've got your first step into uh, becoming a Rust developer. This is one of the easiest ways to go about it. And if you have thought that computer programming is a little more tricky than this, um, it, it can be. The, though generally, this is you know along the lines of uh, what being a developer is. You just writing these uh, commands that a computer will run. So if we wanted to print this uh, three times, right? We would, uh, we you know, we'd copy and paste it three times or four times. <laughs> we'll click the run and it should print it four times. There you go. At this point, if you've gotten this far, you are essentially a Rust programmer, an entry level Rust programmer, uh, though you can call yourself a Rust programmer and you're that much closer to uh, writing the next step, right? Where do you go from here? What's the next step? Oh, I guess you could go outside of the tutorial 
and it's asking us to run the compiler directly on our system. This is how you would uh, typically operate with Rust as well. You'd, you'd run the Rust compiler and then you would execute the code and it would uh, it would execute the code just like this. So I could, let's do that really quick. That's that's what we'll do. We'll follow the rest of this tutorial here. We'll compile this code. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a file called hello rs. So what I'll do is I'll take my initial code here on the page, there's a copy button. So I'm gonna click that copy button I'm going to go over to my terminal window and I'll paste it into a hello.rs file. And I can uh, see what's in that file. So you can see this is the same file that I had uh, on this page. And then I'll run rust c on hello.rs. And it should create a, a binary. The compiler will look through all my code, uh, run a whole bunch of comparisons, and build the code that matches uh, my instructions. Okay, so it's completed. If I look in my directory, I now have my original text file, which is the code file, and a new binary file, which is 453 kilobytes. Uh, my original file was only just a few bytes, right? Uh, 193 bytes, which is, you know, 193 characters. But the binary ended up being pretty beefy. Now I can run that by doing forward slash hello dot forward slash hello. If I run that, it should just print hello world, just like it did in the example. So we did it. We wrote our first Rust program. We built our uh, own a binary. Now this binary can run on any computer. Essentially, you have to you you compile this for the target machine. So you run it on a Mac. You could even run it on an iPhone. You can run it on an Android phone. You could run it on an IoT device. You can run it anywhere. You just compile it, and now you have a program that can run on a computer. And that's it. That's really simple, right? I really. <laughs> so we did it. We followed the instructions. Uh, what we can do next is get more advanced. We see what more features does this compiler offer? What additional functions can we call? Can we write our own functions? Can we write math operators? There's a lot of stuff we can do. Programming languages are really powerful and Rust is one of the greatest, most popular languages today, specifically because it is very powerful, super fast, and it's got extra safety guardrails built in at compile time, which solves the majority of problems that occur when you deploy software in the real world. When we're writing our Rust code, we wanna be able to document what each of the things that we're trying to accomplish in a code comment. Code comments are a way of sort of a uh, code hygiene, it's its a, um, what do you call it? It's a pattern that we wanna use and implement in order to help guide our thinking process as we are writing our code and document what we are attempting to accomplish. Rust programming allows us uh, to have uh, several kinds of code comments. Now we've got a double forward slash at the beginning. Uh, we, this will indicate that the rest of the line is gonna be a comment. Now a comment would be something that is only for the human, right? basically just for you. The compiler will ignore those comments because it doesn't need that information. It has the code that you've given it. Oh yeah, it was a, uh, the uh, regular comments which are ignored by the compiler. Now there's another kind of comment and ooh, what is this? There's an explanation one. All right, so doc comments. These comments are used to help go a step further to take uh, the usability of the functions that you write and then generate code documentation. It's still for the humans in this case, uh, though it is more structured and allows you to define an easy to follow process when reusing code. We don't have to go through these. These are these are really powerful and great from a code hygiene perspective. They are not necessary uh, for the tutorial. So here we have our main function and it's got a whole bunch of code comments. Uh, it even has a code line here where it says print hello world. If I, it well, if I don't have that, let's see here, I wanna double check. So let's comment everything out. Basically, if I run this program and it's just a bunch of code comments, uh, the program will run, it'll execute, but there's no commands, no output. If I uncomment this code and then I click run, then the, of course, now the, the code executes and it actually has a task assigned to it, so it'll print hello world. So what we can do is go a step further. Now that uh, we've got all of our documentation with our code here, we can manipulate expressions easily. Oh, look what it wants us to do. All right, this is kind of new. Um, so what they have here for us is a variable. The variable is x. x is equal to five plus five. This, however, because there's these uh, forward slash star, forward slash star forward slash, that's a comment. The compiler will ignore that. Now we know that this is a kind of comment that you can do 
to sort of change how the program works. However, if you want it, it's like, it's like a nice quick way to um, keep the code that you want. You want to keep the code that you want there, uh, though you don't want the compiler to use it. So this is a good way to go about that. So if, let me, uh, let's run this really quick. Do a little bit of cleanup there. All right, so now we have x, five plus five, that's 10. So x should be 10 in this case. So if I run this program, it should say x is equal to 10. Here we go, x is equal to 10. And we have this little, uh, these curly braces will be interpolated by this x. You can also, uh, which is more readable, I like this approach a little better. You can put x inside here and you no longer need this. So if I run that, that's a little more readable. I like that a little bit better. It'll give you the same, the same output. These little brackets here, uh, curly braces they will interpolate this the value of x and put it right here so if i change that up a little bit i can put a couple of little quote marks in there so i can see that now x should be surrounded by quote marks let's do the tutorial so the tutorial asked us to all right so see how there's 90 here we can remove these uh comments so now it should, x should be 5 plus 90 plus 5 which is 100 so if i run this now it'll say x equals 100. we did it wait we programmed with Rust. We, we used code comments, so that way we can write uh, what we want. Uh, we can put our thoughts however we want in, in our code, and this is only for the humans, only for the humans. So we've got our code comment there. We also used a variable and the variable called x, uh, and we assigned it to some numbers. And then we printed that variable using the print macro, and then we ran our program, uh, and the output was this. So that's a lot, that's a lot, but also at the same time, it very few keystrokes. It's very few keystrokes. We're learning how to program Rust. By example, on the documentation for Rust and learning how to code, Rust makes it really easy with Rust by example. They take us through a series of tutorials that allow us to edit the code directly in the page. The next one we're looking at is formatted print. So we've been using the print macro, which allows text to be outputted from the program. And it can go a step further if you take the, the rules that are sort of the print macro capability has more power built into it. We can do extra, uh, extra printing capabilities. We wanted to print more fun, fancy things. So we know here that if we say print like this, a simple print 31 days, when we have these little braces, these curly braces, 31 will be placed in this, and this will print just fine as 31 days. You can also go a step further, and based on the position, you can put uh, a number in there, and the number will be related to the position of the extra variables that you pass in. So we've got two names, Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice should be zero because it's the first element and Bob will be one and it's the second element. Ah, I don't know, I know what it's said to me. It's weird to say it in like that. It's because it's, it's, it's everything, um, zero counts as the first element. That's how most programming languages are. There are some programming languages like Lua where one represents the number one, it represents the first element, which is more logical, right? You would think that would be the case, but uh, for most programming languages, zero, the zero, th zero position is uh, the first element uh, that's provided. And so this should be Alice. So if I run just these, oh wait, hold on, little syntax over there. All right, let's just, let's just try this really quick. We'll just uh, run this program as this. So we say 31 days and then zero, which is Alice. Alice this is Bob, Bob, this is Alice. We can see that we can use the print command uh, with positions of the arguments as well. It goes more, it goes deeper. Let's check this out. I'm not a big fan of just arbitrary positions, though I can change around it, it might be confusing. I like it better to have named arguments. You can assign a variable with a name. For example, the word object, subject, and verb are variables that can be interpolated within the statement. So if we run this, it's going to use these words. So it doesn't matter what position these arguments come in within the print statement. It just matters what they, uh, their name is. I like that a lot better because it allows you to move things around. It's more flexible and it's easier to read. You don't have to you don't have to reference an, a, a number of some sort saying, what is this right here? What is that? You can just jump right in like, oh, that's going to be subject. All right, so this will be subject. So I can see that it's going to 
print the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog because that's the order that is printed here even though the variables are defined in a different order so we'll try that and see what that looks like we'll run that we should see yep the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog print the print macro is pretty powerful I like this all right we could go even further we can change the representation of oh wow no way you could do this just so you can change the number uh, printed on the screen based on the basis of the number. You can go hexadecimal. Default is base 10. You can go binary, so the numbers will only range between 0 and 1. You can do octal, so the numbers only ever go 0 to 8. I guess 0 to 7, right? So there's only eight numbers. And hexadecimal, which is zero through F. That's kind of neat. I didn't know. That's a, an unexpected feature that I didn't know print even had. So we'll see what that looks like really quick here. We'll uh, play. Click the play button. Yep. And we get our, our bases base 10, 2, 8, and 16. Neat. And it's even got a, if you want your hex numbers to be capitalized, uh, where the letters are, you can do capital X. That's pretty fancy. You can do number padding. Oh, this is awesome. When you're printing output on the screen uh, and you've got things printing all over the place, it's really nice to be able to format that so it looks clean and organized. Otherwise, numbers can just be all over the place. And so you can use something called a padding, which allows the output to be positioned in a way that's very satisfying. So let's let's grab these really quick. I'm going to clean up the screen really quick and we're gonna play that. And we're gonna see numbers formatted. Oh, so this is space padding. So you can see everything kind of all nicely lined up there. This is zero padding in different directions. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's do 50. <laughs> So now I did 50 in all these numbers, and so it should be much larger output uh, in the padding. So there you go. See the ones all the way over here? And see everything's lined up. So you can see what your maximum output range is gonna be, and you'll get these paddings. This is very nice. Now if we run the entire program, uh, the whole example, it goes further. There's this fix me right here. It's gotta fix me in the code comment. I actually ran this one, uh, the one time, like, oh, the documentation's broken, the tutorial's broken. See, so check it out, you get an error. Now this is where the compiler helps you. It catches these errors early on and it says invalid reference positional argument one because there's only one variable. There needs to be two variables in order to support this second value. So you can either say James, uh, uh, Bond James, right? Adding a second name or a second variable, or you can just remove this. What does the code comment say? Fix, add the missing, oh, it says add James. Okay, okay, okay. So we will do James, there we go. So if we can click play now, it should work. I don't know. All right, we click play, let me click play. Is it gonna run? It worked. All right, James Bond, perfect. Walking through the rest of this tutorial real quick, we see a little annotation here that says allow dead code, which is code that's unused and won't be accessed by the program. You could have code or functions defined around your application that you never actually call upon or use. And this is typically a, a code debt of sorts that you want to eliminate and you don't want to have that code sitting around in your file. You can eliminate it or if you plan on using it um, and you just temporarily don't want to access it, you can annotate it with allow dead code. We don't have to go into detail about what this is right now. Um, that is a, a more advanced variable where you can uh, define more advanced data structures, which we don't need to go into right now. We only need to really worry about these things right here, which are numbers or, or strings, right? Uh, a series of letters. So numbers F64 just says it's a floating point number. Before we were looking at these numbers over here, which are integers that have no decimal, as they're just integers and floating point. In terms of the actual system itself, it doesn't really know what the difference is between the two in terms of uh, a fractional number is just computed differently. Fractions are one of the more computationally expensive operations within a computer programming language and computers in general when you're processing fractions. Uh, so as much as possible, you kind of do want to stay in the integer world if you can, because they're a little bit easier to deal with as long as you're not operating with divisions, right? You don't want to have to divide, right? Fractions, divisions. Though if you are and you're in that world, you can use this floating point or F64 and you can define fractions with a whole bunch of numbers and digits. So I just changed that. I press play and you can see the output now is a fraction it's pretty cool. I like this. This is uh, a, a great way to get started in programming Rust. And there is more to go. There's more. There's more details. Uh, this is this is just the foundational entry point just to uh, get started programming Rust.